The next energy source we can talk about is coal. And coal is an important resource because there's a lot of it. It can take us far into the future as an energy source, but there's a lot of environmental impacts from the extraction process to burning the coal for electricity. And we use coal as the greatest single source of electricity in our country. So it's important to talk about this resource. All right, and here you go. Here's the United States electricity generation by energy source. And this is always changing, and coal has actually been declining in the past couple of years because of the increase of natural gas as an electricity source. But if you take a look here, we still use coal as our major source of electricity, especially in the East Coast where most of the American population is. Here, if we take a look at the sources of electricity in Pennsylvania, you can quickly realize that we are a coal state. We not only have coal, but we use it to produce our electricity. Along with nuclear, it makes up, it meets over 90% of our state's electricity needs. All right, so what is coal? Coal is a sedimentary rock, and you can think about the state of Pennsylvania having a lot of high-grade anthracite coal. and one of the reasons is because hundreds of millions of years ago in the Pennsylvanian period of geologic history, Pennsylvania was a not only a shallow sea, but also big giant areas of swampland. Okay, and in swamps, organic material builds up very quickly. And the buildup of organic material is called peat. Okay, and peat is going to be the first stage in the formation of coal. So you have organic material being laid down and layered, and then it will become geologically buried and succumb to heat and pressure. Okay, so as it gets buried and compacted into a rock, the first type of rock it will become is called lignite. And you see the word light in lignite because you can literally light it on fire. But lignite is the preliminary stages of what's going to become coal. If you succumb lignite to further heat and pressure and time, okay, it'll become bituminous coal. All right, and bituminous is by far the most common type of coal all right, used in the generation of electricity, but it's also the dirtiest. It has the most amount of pollutants. It has the greatest amount of impurities. But bituminous coal is the most common, so it's the most widely used. Take bituminous coal and introduce more heat pressure and time and it'll become the highest type of coal out there called anthracite and Pennsylvania is a state rich in both bituminous and anthracite coal but anthracite it takes the longest amount of time heat and pressure to make it however it has the greatest amount of heat over the longest amount of time it's the hardest type of coal it's the cleanest type of coal supplies are not as great as bituminous but Pennsylvania does have a good amount um, so Pennsylvania is an important coal state okay so that's your highest grade of coal and that's the progression from peat to lignite to bituminous coal to anthracite so now that you know about the types of coal let's talk about how we get it there's two types of mining. There's subsurface mining, and that's underground tunnels and shafts. And then there's surface mining in the form of strip mining or mountaintop removal. So let's take a look at these types of mining and some of the environmental impacts. Okay, subsurface mining, like I said, has a, a storied history, in, especially in the state of Pennsylvania. All right, but this is a very dangerous way to get coal, and you typically don't get as much coal from subsurface mining than you do from surface mining like strip mines and mountaintop removal. All right, so this is the traditional way where deep deposits were accessed from tunnels. Uh, early miners succumbed to things like black lung disease, all right, where you breathe, continuously breathe in coal dust and it accumulates in your lungs, which prevents the breathing process. So it's very similar to emphysema. Um, Another problem with subsurface mining is that coal is mixed with methane gas, which is flammable. So you can not only have illnesses from inhaling this, but you can also have the explosions or fire underneath the, the coal mines. Um, and then there's always the issue of collapse. So underground subsurface mining is very dangerous, uh, and it doesn't produce a large amount of coal. So this is something that you know we're moving away from, but it's still occurs, uh, especially in a lot of developing countries and even in the United States there are subsurface coal mines. 
All right, and I should remind you that all coal mines, surface and subsurface, cause acid mine drainage. All right, coal has impurities like sulfur dioxide, and when rainwater gets into a coal mine or uh, hits coal that's on the surface or, or those tailing piles we're going to mention in a few seconds, all right, it reacts with the coal and the water forms sulfuric acid and it basically runs off and gets into our creeks and streams and groundwater supplies. All right, there's thousands of miles of streams in PA that are polluted. So you want to look for that yellow reddish color, all right, and then you can tell that a stream has been contaminated, basically destroyed by acid mine runoff. All right, Pennsylvania alone spends millions of dollars on streams that have been polluted. All right, a little bit about surface mines, and this is a strip mine. All right, so basically we strip off the land on top to expose shallow deposits of coal, and then you dig those out. We use huge equipment that basically rips away the land and exposes the coal seam, and we pretty much just remove it and take it away to be burned in a coal-fired power plant. All right, one good thing about coal is there's not too much production. You can literally dig it out of the ground and burn it as is. All right, whereas oil and other sources need refinement and a lot of energy goes into uh, preparing the product to be burned. Coal, you literally dig it out and you can burn it right out of the ground. Um, so what we're doing here is exposing coal seams and just doing that. We're digging the coal out uh, to be shipped off and burned at uh, power plants. So if you look at this operation, this is a, a fairly big operation. The top surface of the land has been removed. All right, you see a crane back here in the background doing the work. And what it's doing is it takes the, the overburden and literally just turns around and puts it on piles behind it. All right, and these, if you remember, are our tailings piles where waste rock is basically stored or accumulates there in piles, but then rainwater hits those tailing piles, reacts with residual coal or any other impurities in rocks, and can run off and become acid mine runoff. So these piles are huge. Here's a bulldozer in the bottom left-hand corner, and here's a port -a john um, So you can get a sense of scale for this operation. But you can see the coal seams here uh, within the within the subsurface that they're they're trying to expose and extract. All right, big operation, uh, lots of carbon footprint with the machinery, um, and then also with the burning of the coal. Okay, just another picture of a crane creating tailings piles. Here's a machine in the bottom right. Um, this is one that's used. It has a big giant grinding wheel, and they basically press that grinding wheel into the side of the hill, and it sh and it shoots out. It does the excavation. It, it it chews up the the coal, and the coal falls down here in piles, which can then later be removed by a front end loader or a or some type of digger. So lots of machinery, big machinery, giant machinery, enormous machinery. Okay, but if you remember, there's a law called the Reclamation Law that says you need to put these surface mines back the way you found it, or you have to reclaim the land. And that's very difficult to do, especially if you've removed millions of tons of product. All right, so either put it back the way it was or to a stable condition. All right, remember about that law. All right, and here's one that uh, they planted grasses. However, the soil quality was too poor to... Uh, to be able to maintain the, the vegetation. Okay, and then the second type of surface mining for coal is mountaintop removal, which is very popular in Appalachia, but it's just what it sounds like. We use dynamite to blow off the top of a mountain and expose a, a coal seam, but the problem is that what do you do with all that material? All right, if you're taking off the top of a mountain, there's a lot of material. In the early 2000s, it was legal to put it into valleys and into streams because at that time it wasn't considered a pollutant, a completely destructive process. All right, today it's considered harmful, it became illegal, so you can no longer put material in valleys. All right, you can't get a permit to do that. All right, valleys are where all the streams are and the aquatic ecosystems. We're now trying to protect those environments. All right, but mountaintop removal was a favorite way to get coal because you can get large amounts of coal quickly and easily. All right, here's one of those valley fills in Kentucky. 
um, completely destroyed a stream that was once in this valley here and uh, create some of an eyesore for local residents. All right, and you can imagine with mountaintop removal, the reclamation process is very tricky and very difficult to get the environment back the way it was. So we have to, in this case, put it into a stable condition. And here's a picture where a golf course was built um, in an old mountaintop removal site. All right, it's one of the more creative ways to reclaim an area. With that being said, that's a little bit about the extraction processes of coal. Very dirty, very energy intensive, uh, a lot of carbon dioxide emissions with the machinery and the equipment, uh, a lot of environmental problems from acid mine runoff to human health effects to uh, difficulty in the reclamation process. But we get a high net energy yield from coal when you compare it to the extraction process of other materials and other energy sources it's fairly cheap and easy so we continue to use coal as a source of electricity especially in the United States but also in the world so how is coal used to make electricity and that's what this little diagram shows you so a supply of coal is usually brought in by train or truck and piled outside of a coal-fired power plant all right it is then supplied onto a conveyor belt where it enters the facility and goes directly into a boiler where it's going to be burned. All right. So then what we have to do is we use a series of pipes to allow water into the burning area which will turn to steam Okay, and we can compress that steam into high energy pipes which is connected to a turbine which spins a bunch of blades which is connected to a magnet and a coil of wire which turns a generator okay which converts that energy into electricity and can go out onto the grid so like all fossil fuels that are burned to produce steam and water that steam can then be compressed and shot through a turbine hooked up to a generator to produce electricity but in the burning of the coal process in the boiler it creates a lot of smoke, a lot of particulates and air pollution go out of the boiler and up the smokestack and into the environment. Okay, some of those impurities include sulfur dioxide, uh, mercury, okay, nitrous oxides, and of course carbon dioxide. So coal in particular has a lot of impurities in it that we need to be aware of because some of these contribute to climate change and others contribute to human health effects. So what can we do to reduce the amount of impurities that come out when you burn coal? All right, Because one of the problems is it takes a lot of coal to run a power plant. So the impact is magnified by the sheer amount of coal that's needed. All right, One of the things we can do, and that is done, is the use of scrubbers. All right, the scrubbers are basically a filter system that can scrub or filter out certain particulates like carbon dioxide or flue gas desulfurization scrubbers. All right, All right and they're going to scrub out the sulfur dioxide. So you can scrub out certain particulates. Now these improvements or uh, filters are very expensive and some power plants use them and others don't but they're very expensive however you can remove some of these particulates and impurities out of the emissions okay they're anywhere between 70 and 90 percent effective which is good okay but you do still have some of this stuff uh, being emitted from the coal-fired power plant all right take a look here it basically shows you the sheer amount of coal and this is one power plant where a big pile of coal is waiting to be loaded onto the conveyor belt and in the background there you see the train cars uh, all filled to the top with coal different pictures of two power plants one where there's smoke coming out of it and the other where there is nothing coming out of it and I show this picture for a reason the one with the smoke that is coming out does not have a scrubber attached all right the other one is on there's emissions coming out of it however there is a scrubber in that one that one has less impurities coming out of it but what I do want to stress is just because you don't see smoke doesn't mean that it's off okay that one might have a scrubber attached um, there's still stuff coming out of it it's just not as much all right and 
where are the plants? All right, where are the coal-fired power plants in the United States? And this is a very important map in my mind because it's going to explain a lot of human health effects, especially on the east coast of the United States. All right, the coal-fired power plants, if you notice here, are concentrated just a bit west of Appalachia. All right, most of the United States population is on the east coast, so that's where the energy is in demand. So you'll notice lots of coal-fired power plants scattered around the East Coast, but that concentration is going to supply a lot of energy to where most of the people live in the country. Now what we need to be concerned about is this concentration just west of Appalachia because the trade winds, all right, the westerlies, which bring all weather from west to east, is also going to bring the emissions from those power plants directly into our area where we live. Okay, so the emissions and the health impacts from coal-fired power plants is basically an East Coast problem. If you notice, not too many West Coast coal-fired power plants. Most of these are in the East Coast. So let's look at some of those impacts. All right, in the case of sulfur dioxide, all right, being emitted from coal-fired power plants, smokestacks will pump that stuff real high in the atmosphere where it reacts with water and becomes sulfuric acid. All right, and if you notice the concentration of sulfuric acid is just to the east of where our concentration of coal-fired power plants are. The normal pH of rainwater is about five and a half. Okay, so typical rainwater, natural rainwater is slightly acidic. And if you notice here in the west coast where there's not too many coal-fired power plants, um, rainwater is what it's supposed to be, slightly acidic. But if you notice here in the East Coast, 4.4, 4.5, 4.5, it's 10 times more acidic than it should be. So sulfur dioxide is coming from coal that's being burned. All right, when it reacts with sulfuric acid, it, come back, it comes back down to the ground as acid rain, all right, which is corrosive to metals, it's corrosive to living tissue. All right, so it's an issue that we need to deal with um, in regards to coal-fired power plants. As I mentioned, some plants have desulfurization scrubbers, all right, but many don't because of the sheer cost. But here's a map that can particularly concerns me um, because mercury is a neurotoxin, okay? And if you remember, here's where our concentration of coal-fired power plants are. And if you look, we are smack dab into um, one of the worst areas in the country for atmospheric mercury deposition. We are doing better uh, since the 1990s when the, the Clean Air Act amendments were passed, which basically focused on emissions from coal-fired power plants. We're doing a lot better, um, particularly with the emissions of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. And a little bit about nitrogen oxides, uh, you should know a lot about how excess of nitrogen in the environment basically over fertilizes ecosystems particularly aquatic ones so you have those algal blooms you have which lead to dead zones all right so nitrogen oxides aren't something we want in the environment and they're emitted uh, by coal-fired power plants they also cause uh, uh, ground level ozone um, they're small particulates within nitrogen oxides that create smog some people uh, trigger triggers a uh, asthma attacks, things like that. But power plant emissions have actually been declining of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides uh, and are predicted to continue to decline uh, as some of these coal-fired power plants are including scrubbers and things like that because of the Clean Air Act amendments of the 1990s. Okay, but there's something else we can do and we could pursue clean coal as an answer to some of these emissions. All right, and clean coal is, is coal that does not make air pollution. So this will tell you a little bit about what it is. When coal burns, all right, it releases carbon dioxide and some other emissions in the flue gas. All right, those are the emissions all right, that pour out of smokestacks. Clean coal technologies purify the coal before it is burned. Okay, and one example is called coal washing. Coal washing is a process where you basically soak the coal in a chemical and it will remove some of those impurities like the sulfur dioxides and the nitrogen oxides so that when you do go to burn the coal, there's less of those impurities in it, therefore there'll be less emissions. 
Okay, that's what clean coal technology is. Preparing the coal before you burn it. Another example is called gasification. Okay, so here's a, a diagram of gasification. And you can kind of think of what it is. What we're going to do is we're going to basically turn the coal to a gas and then burn the gas. So here you go. You add coal and oxygen into uh, some sort of boiler. All right, we're going to add water because what it's going to do is it's going to literally gasify the, the coal. You will get waste product in the form of slag. All right, and that slag is wet. That's why the water is added to uh, allow any solid particulates to settle to the bottom. And what we want is the gas. All right, so now you put the gas through a cooling and cleaning process, but then what we're going to do is we're going to burn the gas in a boiler to boil water and turn a turbine, generate electricity. Okay, so gasification is taking all those impurities out. Hopefully they deposit with the slag, and then we're burning a little bit more cleaner of a gas instead of um, the coal itself, which has those impurities in it. All right, now you're creating a waste product which needs to be disposed of as hazardous waste, but at least it's down there and in disposal instead of in the atmosphere. Okay, aside from clean coal technologies, there are some other things we can do to reduce or eliminate some of the emissions from coal fired power plants. In this case, we're looking at the carbon dioxide. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a process called carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration is just that. We're going to sequester the carbon dioxide that is emitted from coal fired power plants. So the first thing we need to do is capture it, all right, and then sequester it. So for example, if we can find old depleted oil and gas reservoirs or uh, uh, salt domes, okay, unminable coal beds, and we're going to literally do deep well injection of the, the carbon dioxide. Okay, another popular one is to take it out into the ocean on uh, offshore rigs and basically shoot it down into the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so this, this deep well injection process uh, we can use to sequester carbon dioxide, and then at least it's not emitted into the atmosphere where it can contribute to climate change as a greenhouse gas. Okay, so we're going to use geologic time and we're going to store it underground so that it's not in the atmosphere. All right, it doesn't really solve the problem. It's just a way of mitigating. It's less severe of an impact by hiding it. We're trying to reduce the environmental impact of coal. In this case, it's contributor to climate change. All right, the last environmental impact that I have to present, a case study from the Kingston Coal Plant in Tennessee. In 2008, there was a disaster at this coal plant. And if you take a look here, you see the, the coal pile outside of this facility, and you can see the uh, conveyor belt going into the facility, and then you see the two giant smokestacks. But what your eyes really don't focus on is this big lake behind the, the coal plant itself. All right, this lake isn't really even a lake. What that is is a big giant pile of coal ash. All right? From the sheer amount of coal that needs to be burned at a coal-fired power plant, there's a lot of coal ash that's produced. And typically, what happens to that coal ash is that it's piled up behind the facilities. All right, so we have these big giant coal ash piles and they're exposed to the elements so when rainwater hits these things it kind of mixes into this coal ash and water mixture if you want to call it sludge okay so this coal ash and water mixture becomes an environmental hazard because if that coal ash mixture uh, leaks into the environment or uh, seeps into the groundwater we have a problem and that's just what happened in the Kingston coal plant disaster of 2008 here are these coal ash piles which become ponds because of the mixture with rainwater and in 2008 the one at Kingston broke and this coal ash and water mixture flooded the nearby area and basically destroyed the environment ecosystems creeks and streams and in this case this house was a victim of this coal ash sludge flood. Okay, so you can think about that as you consider all the other impacts. Um, this is just another one to uh, add to the list. All right, so to finish up here and to recap, overall, coal as an energy source is dirty to the air, it's dirty to the water, it's dirty to the land. It's very environmentally destructive from the extraction process to burning it for electricity. 
but why do we keep doing it? Why is 40% of our energy needs met by this resource? It burns and produces cheap energy. Okay? So, you be the judge. Do the benefits outweigh the risks? You decide. I was working really hard to try and get you some of the environmental impacts. Um, however, the economic impact is another one to consider. All right? Burns cheap energy. This presentation was dedicated to all those of you out there who put mustard on everything. You know who you are. <laughs>